Good evening and welcome everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, Japan Society lecture. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm Heidi Potter and I'm from the Japan Society where since April we've moved all our events online. Although nothing can replace the joy of meeting and talking in person, we've been delighted that virtual events have allowed us to bring together speakers and audiences from many different parts of the UK and overseas. Tonight's no exception. And it's a real pleasure to introduce Mamiko Markham in Wales, Zoe Hendon in London, and Sarah Demare, who's joining us from the Isle of Wight. Before we get started properly, just a few housekeeping notes. At the moment, um, audience microphones are muted. Could you please stay muted during the presentations just to avoid any sound interference? However, it is always nice for people people who are presenting to be able to see the audience. And so we'd love to see your video if you're happy to turn it on. But do note that we are recording this event. Um, at the end of all three presentations, there will be time for questions. And you'll be able to mute, unmute at that point if you wish to do so to ask a question. And I'll explain a bit more about that process when we get there. In the meantime, you can also ask questions as we go along using the chat function in Zoom. And we'll try to scoop up all those questions at the end. But on to the business for this evening. And it's been about a year since my colleague Kyoko came across Sarah's wonderful Katazome work and told me about the collection of Katagami at the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture and the major research project they undertook on the 400 Katagami, which they hold in, its, in the Silver Studio collection. And this research project lasted about two years between 2016 and 18. And it's a really fascinating project. So if you haven't yet done so, I recommend that you explore the collection and the wealth of research on the MODA website. And today we're lucky to have with us Zoe Hendon, Head of Collections at the Museum, who will speak about the collection and the impact of Katagami on Western art de design traditions. And Sarah Demare, a textile designer and craft researcher, who will speak about Katagami in the context of her contemporary artistic practice. But we're starting tonight with Mamiko Markham, a researcher particularly of Japanese and Asian weaving and dyeing. And Mamiko was involved with the Moda Research Project, looking at the historical context of the katagami in the collection, and she's going to be speaking about that. So welcome Mamiko, I'll hand over to you now. And I know that you're going to share your screen. So um, if you're ready to do so, that would be great. And we'll need to unmute yourself as well. Hi, I'm Mamiko Markham. Hello. Um, katazome, I'm talking about katagami and katazome today. Katazome is the name of the process for stencil dyeing using katagami. Yes. And yuze is the technique famous for dyeing floral patterns on kimono. This applies dye by both freehand paintings and katagami. There has always been a custom of wearing elegant using kimono, which is a present to a daughters by their parents from the daughter's 20-year-old ceremony. Now, um, katagami here is finely cut paper stencils used in the patterning of a cross and uh, one of the dyeing tools for kimonos. They have various attractive patterns and precise carving open work techniques by skilled craftsmen. In the late 19th century, large quantities of Edo made katagami were sold to the West, including Silver Studios collection. Since then, Katagami received some attention and little information was known about the production methods. For example, it is not it is not generally known that the courtesans kimonos and kabuki actors were portrayed by Yukioi artists in the Edo period and had a strong relationship with the pattern designs of katagami. For example, this is a hokusai kimono pattern named Kiko, shown here top left and featured in the Yukioe art center. This did 
become a kimono pattern from an existing katagami on the right. Yukioe artist Katsushika Hokusai is famous for his great waves and landscapes, but he also published many sketchbooks and works of women wearing beautiful kimonos and fashionable kimono pattern books for katagami merchants. His works were essential in the golden age of kimono production in the Edo period. Hokusai, no, Hokusai, number four, still number four. Hokusai, Kunisada, and other Yukioe artists portray the most fashionable kimonos worn by celebrity kabuki actors and courtesans. After that, katagami makers immediately imitate the patterns. These were then sold by katagami merchants to dyers and soon after appeared in kimono shops. Additionally, working class people wanted to enjoy these fashions. They both used the kimono at local temple markets, washed and resewn them for wearing their special occasions, such as for hanami, cherry blossom viewing. So this katagami, chrysanthemum arabesque, arabesque, kiku karaksa pattern. It's a typical katagami design around the 18th century during the Edo period. It features open work pattern, tsukibori push cutting knife technique. This type of carving is typically used to produce large flowers, plants, birds, and uh, geometric patterns. The tasteful expression from tsukibori was desirable to, de desirable to Western collectors in the 19th centuries. This kiku karakusa pattern has a good luck meaning. It was a popular design for quality futon fabric of high-ranking courtesans throughout the 18th and the 19th centuries. Graceful iris pattern here. This katagami of late 19th century, iris patterns were adopted in paintings, crafts, and no opera costumes since the 10th century and still popular today. This Utagawa Kunisada's ukiyo-e portraits and iris pattern kimono, often worn by townspeople of Edo. Katagami employed techniques of tsukibori push cutting, shimabori stripe cutting, and itoire silk thread reinforcement. Open work patterns of this nature particularly with long thin stripes required reinforcement to prevent tearing and distortion during dyeing. This katagami with a fine shark skin pattern called same common, made by kiribori drill cutting technique. This uses a semi-circular stenciling brace with a rotating action to cut out circles. Extremely fine detail can be achieved. In some cases, around 900 circles in three square centimeters. Different sizes, arrangements, and distances between circles can produce different expressions and impressions. An incredibly difficult and complex process. Same common. In particular, was frequently applied to create kamishimo, the matched set of stiff shouldered vest and hakama trousers for high-ranking samurai in the Edo period. Daimyos, the major feudal lords, 250 nationwide were required to officially visit Edo every other year with their entourage. Each daimyo needed to wear a brand new kamishimo dyed in black, gray, indigo, or brown with his own common family crest. Their kamishimo must look like a solid color. From a distance and display top quality to show respect for Shogun Tokugawa. Thus, 
They needed both the finest designs and technical quality. For this reason, the fine carving of kiribori and skilled dyeing techniques had to be conducted by local master craftsmen. Katagami here carved by dogbori tool punching technique. These tools were made to stamp out pretty determined shapes, such as flowers, buns, or wheat stalks. It looks plain and solid from a distance, but its patterned appearance has a smart impression from these techniques and was favored by urban women in the Edo period. The Edo shogunate enforced the law prohibiting townspeople from using silk and gorgeous costume. But people turned this law into fashionable taste. It did not look luxurious, but was fashionable and smart, quiet colors and attention to detail. Katazume dyeing using katagami has been actively operated in Japan for 900 years to the present. The purpose behind katazome dyeing was to enable mass production, especially for dyers responding kimono, ma kimono market needs in the Edo period. They usually applied resist paste or print colors via katagami, repeating 30 to 40 times on about an eight meter length of fabric for a kimono. Daya must place the katagami in register to accurately repeat the pattern of resist paste without any slight deviation. This was only capable by master craft daya. Now, I would like to show you a variable katagami. This is a full katagami set all are required to produce the intended pattern. These were made in Miyagi Prefecture, northeastern Japan, in the late 19th century. This set was particularly difficult to process and would have needed this design, would have needed the design plan before carving took place. This could not, could not be produced today due to the extraordinary high level of skill and expertise in carving and dyeing required. This piece of fabric, produced from a former katagami set, has been accredited as holding the title of important intangible cultural property. The pattern design is called Fukura Suzume, Sparrows with inflated wings parting on bamboo, having the meaning of good luck and favored by townspeople in, in the Edo period. The style of this pattern is called Urumigata. This Urumigata pattern is an epoch making creation which achieved the appearance of Shibori pattern, which is just a full katagami. Shibori? It's common, commonly thought of in the West as tie-dye. The truth is that a far more skillful technique. Shibori is manual register dyeing. Traditionally, to achieve the desired pattern required binding certain sections of the cloth using thread tied to form tiny dots. During the end of up to Showa period, Farmer women were making shibori as a side job, comprising about 20,000 small dots in one kimono. It needed enormous time and effort and not suited to mass production. Therefore, katagami makers tried to innovate Urumigata to imitate the appearance of shibori pattern. Using katagami for this purpose was a major strategy for the kimono business in the Edo period, being able to produce look-alike shibori in higher volumes of kimono. Yes, 
So using katagami in different ways has a wide range of creativity. Katagami deployment still holds many mysteries. My research continues to unlock Katagami's secret. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mamiko. That was absolutely fascinating. The Thank skill you. and the detail in some of those designs is quite phenomenal. Um, that intangible cultural property, I can quite understand why it was. it is so special. Um, if, just a reminder to people who've joined us since we started, um, if you have questions as we're going along, do add them in the chat. Um, we'll try and pick them up afterwards. Um, but you can also uh, ask your own questions at the very end as well um, when we get to the question time. So next um, up is Zoe Hendon. I've lost your mask. Oh, there you are, Zoe. Um, I'll hand over to you. And you, I think you're also going to share a screen, aren't you? Nope. So can you all see that? Perfect. Great. So uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great honor to be here to speak to you today about the Katagami in the Silver Studio Collection that is held by the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture at Middlesex University. So I'm going to give you a bit of background about the Silver Studio Collection and then explain how the Katagami were used by British designers of wallpapers and textiles in the 1890s. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank the Arts Council Designation Fund, which enabled us to do some research, as Heidi mentioned, on the Kati Katagami collection between 2016 and 2018, and in which both Mamiko and Sarah were participants. So it's really great that the project is still generating further research and interest. Uh, hang on. <clears throat> so... Um, some of the things I show you probably won't look very Japanese to you, but as we will see, British people at the end of the 19th century wanted things that they thought were Japanese without being too worried about whether, this, whether those things were authentic or not. By the 1890s, Japan was exporting things to suit Western tastes and British manufacturers were producing things that were inspired by Japanese design, but were not actually Japanese. And so the results were things that represented a kind of cultural hybrid of motifs and patterns. So the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture now holds the Silver Studio collection. And the Silver Studio was a commercial design studio founded by this man, Arthur Silver, and based in Hammersmith, West London, and he started that in 1880. Arthur Silver employed a small number of designers and together they produced designs for wallpapers and textiles, which they sold to manufacturers and retailers around the country. The Silver Studio in fact continued into the 20th century under the management of Arthur's son Rex. I should explain, by the way, that when the Silver Studio closed in the 1960s, the contents of the studio were given to Hornsey College of Art, which is why it has subsequently come to be part of Middlesex University. But if you can imagine that when it closed, the studio contained over 80 years worth of design work and material that had been collected as design, um, visual reference for design, such as the Katagami that we're looking at today. So Arthur Silver was just one of many British designers at the end of the 19th century who were interested in the art of Japan and whose work was influenced by Japanese material culture. Britain had first experienced a craze for all things Japanese in the 1870s and 80s. In these decades, Japan, as you probably know, um, opened up to trade with the West after a long period of isolation. Europeans saw Japanese art and design as exciting and exotic because it, because it was so different to Western culture. So it became fashionable for wealthy consumers to fill their homes with Japanese items or things they thought looked a bit Japanese. So for example, in this painting, you can see fans, um, blue and white porcelain, silk fabric, uh, wallpapers and textiles that featured Japanese motifs such as cranes, dragons, chrysanthemums, and key patterns became very fashionable.
Magazines such as Artistic Japan were published in French, German and English from 1888 enabling readers to find out more about Japanese craft and visual culture. And of course, organizations like the Japan Society itself, which was founded in 1891, helped to promote this cross-cultural dialogue. In fact, we know that Arthur Silver was himself a member of the Japan Society, along with other key people such as Liberty, Charles Holm and Christopher Dresser. It's just a shame that because we've been in lockdown all this time, I haven't been able to get to the museum for you know, six months since March, we've all been working at home. So I would have liked to be able to show you Arthur Silver's um, membership of the Japan Society, but unfortunately I wasn't able to get to that for this evening. Um, anyway, the, the London department store, Liberty & Co, opened in 1875, and from early as 1876 was selling Japanese wallpapers and fabrics. And Arthur, Arthur Liberty travelled to Japan himself, as did other British designers such as Christopher Dresser and Walter Crane. But Arthur Silver and the designers he employed never visited Japan themselves, but they were avid collectors of Japanese source material. So for example, the Silver Studio collection includes three volumes of photographs by Japanese photographer Kazumasa Ogawa, dating from the early 1890s. And we imagine that they were used by designers as part of their work because many of the pages are splattered with ink and paint. So these are, these are very beautiful photographs or rather color types of things like chrysanthemums and other Japanese plants. And as I say, we, we think that the Silver Studio designers were um, using them as reference material. So for example, in this here we see uh, a, a lit, um, an iris, which uh, Mamiko has already mentioned was very popular in Japan, and then a design for a uh, textile or wallpaper by the Silver Studio, which clearly has some kind of reference to it. So in this way, the Silver Studio was using um, Japanese influences in the sense of flower and plant forms that derive from Japan or were were strongly associated with Japan, even when they were depicted in a more Western style as here. Um, but even the fact of um, depicting an iris would have seemed exotic to Western or British consumers, because it wasn't a plant that was very familiar. As well as the Agawa photographs, the Silver Studio also owned other Japanese sources, such as two books of crests or mon, and again, Mamiko has mentioned these, uh, they're, they're kind of crests that, that um, people would have on their kimono to denote their family uh, connections. So the Silver Studios British employees probably had very little idea of the cultural significance of these symbols, but just saw them as interesting examples of geometric and formalized pattern. So they incorporated some of these motifs from things like the Books of Mon into textile designs for clients such as Liberty. And here you can see a Japanese influenced fabric which features butterflies, Mon type roundels and a kind of cherry blossom motif on a background of formalized hexagonal flowers, all of which seem to you know, be influenced by Japanese motifs. And as I say, British design British consumers had a taste for things that looked a bit Japanese and retailers like Liberty responded by commissioning British designers to satisfy this demand. But one of the most important Japanese influences on the Silver Studio was the collection of Katagami stencils that they acquired sometime in the early 1890s. So as Mariko was saying, katagami stencils were traditionally used in Japan in the Meiji and Edo periods to apply pattern to kimono fabric by means of a resist printing method. After the opening of Japan to Western trade in the 1860s, katagami stencils became very popular in the West. Western travellers to Japan bought them in large numbers and took them back to Europe. Many were acquired by art colleges and museums or by industrial schools in textile producing centers. 
um, or in this case by um, a commercial design company. So Europeans were fascinated by the stylization of the motifs, as well as the technical brilliance of the cutting. These kinds of pattern had never been seen in the West, and we can only imagine how astonishing they must have seemed to British designers. We don't know exactly how Arthur Silver acquired his collection of katagami, but items like this would almost certainly have been available at London shops like Liberty & Co. There are about 400 katagami in the Silver Studio collection, mostly dating from the 1860s and 70s, but with a few much earlier examples. And one of the things that Mamiko did when uh, she researched our collection was to identify the cases in which uh, there are pat uh, katagami which are pairs, which in, or threes or even fours, so th where you need multiple katagami to create one design. So we know that Arthur Silver must have been particularly interested in katagami stencils because photographs of his own home show that it was decorated with, decorated with Japanese woodcuts and framed katagami stencils. You can see them on the back wall there behind the piano. Also there are chrysanthemums on the top of the piano which again are indicating his interest in, in all things Japanese. So he had them in his own home as uh, decorative items, but he also kept most of them, we think, in the studio itself, which is how we come to have them today. Arthur Silver was not alone in collecting katagami. Other collections that survive in the UK are at Brinton's Carpet Company in Kidderminster and at the Leeds University Textile Ar Archive. In both cases, they would have been collected as inspiration for designers or people training to become designers. The v &A also has a large collection and numerous museum collections across Europe also hold thousands of katagami acquired around the same time as the Silver Studios. And a couple of years ago, well in 2012, there was a major exhibition in um, Tokyo called Katagami Style, which traced the influence of katagami on Western art and design, in uh, particularly the Art Nouveau and Art Deco periods. If you can imagine there's these uh, very stylized patterns, very geometric patterns, all had a, a huge influence on Western art of the early 20th century because people in the West were seeing them uh, in museum collections. But how did the, the uh, Silver Studio use katagami? Well, they used them in, in three main ways, really. The designers who worked for the studio created direct prints from some of the katagami, probably as a way of becoming more familiar with the motifs. They didn't, I don't think they understood that this was a resist process, so they created direct prints instead. So rather than using rice paste, they just uh, printed directly through them. They also incorporated katagami motifs into designs for textiles, albeit in perhaps a rather clumsy fashion. So this design you can see here is uh, designed for a kind of lace curtain, which is a strange hybrid of Western and Japanese motifs. And in the, the kind of infills between, uh, within, the, um, within the inset into the pattern are is a design from the katagami that you see here. So for their British customers, the inclusion of motifs from katagami in these patterns added a touch of the exotic to otherwise fairly conventional designs. Arthur Silver's enthusiasm for katagami can be seen by the fact that he gave a lecture to the Architectural Association in London in 1896, in which he outlined his approach to designing with stencils. Interestingly, he made direct reference to his own collection of katagami stencils, some of which he had taken along that evening, and he explained his indebtedness to Japanese ideas. This lecture and the ensuing discussion revealed the problematic status of 
stencils in relation to art and craft and industry, certainly in the minds of British designers. Silver acknowledged that stenciling had long been regarded as a poor relation in comparison to other kinds of decorative art because it relied too much on mechanical processes. In other words, it was closer to machine work than handwork, and therefore some of Silver's contemporaries looked down on it. So whereas, uh, as it was clear from Mamiko's presentation, in Japan, uh, stenciling was, uh, you know, extremely highly skilled uh, technique. In the West, it was seen as a slightly uh, second rate um, uh, craft or something closer to um, mechanical production rather than art. However, the Katagami stencils prompted Arthur Silver to think about the technique of stenciling in general. Other British designers were also becoming interested in the idea of stenciling around this time. And in around 1893, Rotman and Silver set up a new joint venture producing stenciled wall coverings for the British market. So as I explained earlier, the Silver Studio generally only supplied the designs for wallpapers and textiles. They did not produce wallpapers and textiles themselves. So this was something a little bit different. Alexander Rotman was a businessman and importer of Japanese leather papers, as well as an avid collector of Japanese items. He had a factory in Yokohama, which produced Japanese leather paper or Kinkara Kawakami, uh, but this was, a, this was a, a form of emboss, embossed wallpaper made to look like leather. So Japanese leather paper was a, a kind of hybrid product seen as authentically Japanese by Westerners, but understood as Western by the Japanese. So this partnership between Rotman and Silver was clearly an attempt to do something a little bit similar uh, in in producing stenciled, uh, stenciled wall coverings. So they developed a new technique for stenciling for wall coverings, which were intended to be used, used instead of wallpaper. The idea was that this enabled consumers to achieve an effect similar to that of hand stenciling directly onto the wall, but without the inconvenience and, and expense that this process entailed. Like the so-called Japanese leather papers, their selling point was the association, of, of, association with ideas of Japan, rather than claiming to be authentically Japanese. It was understood that silver had adapted Japanese stenciling te techniques and adapted to them for the British context. So the, the kind of uh, uh, designs uh, that were part of this range were a bit similar to what you see here, kind of swirly Art Nouveau figures, uh, not terribly um, Japanese looking in the sense that they depicted figures rather than purely uh, patterns. So today the Katagami stencils are part of, as I said, the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture at Middlesex University. They continue to be of huge interest to students and to inspire creative practice today, as you'll hear from Sarah in a minute. It's really fascinating to think that these fragile papers, intended only as a relatively ephemeral tool for printing, continue to speak to us today, over 150 years since they were originally cut by anonymous craftsmen in Japan. Um, that was fascinating and really nice to see um, how the, the craft people were in the UK and, and were using these stencils and um, I'm sure we can discuss that a lot more about that later on in the questions. But I'm going to hand straight over to Sarah, Sarah Demaray, who's been engaging in these stencils, these stencils and this idea in a, in a much more practical and uh, within her own artistic and, and design practice. So I'm going to spotlight Sarah so that you can all see her better. There we go. And hand over to you. Great. Thank you very much. And, and, and thank you, Zoe and Mamika, for your, your great talks. Um, I'm a contemporary Katazome practitioner, but I'm not a very um, traditional one. Um, I'm using Japanese materials and stencil paper and traditional rice paste to, to um, produce res resist printed textiles as an 
examples here. I've got some of my work behind me. Um, I'm at the moment I'm printing. Uh, this is a this is a, a panel of a skirt, which is going to be one rather like this on this dress with six meters of fabric in the in the skirt. I love working with uh, very sheer materials. Um, um, I've also been printing uh, um, scarves onto onto this very transparent silk gauze, um, and I'm. Uh, absolutely smitten by Katazome. I, I intend to spend the rest of my life uh, working in this medium. So uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not a tra traditional practitioner in the sense, obviously, that uh, I, didn't, I didn't learn the craft in Japan. I did recently benefit from funding from the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust to go to Japan and study and do some research there. And I was due to leave in March, two days before the Foreign Office said that we must all stay at home and not travel anywhere. So, so that's on hold. Um, my practice is also not traditional in the sense that the, the materials of traditional Japanese katazome are very much in conversation in my studio with the, with the materials that surround me from my own tradition of, of practice. And so there's a kind of um, cross-cultural dialogue going on there. Um, uh, I'm not, whilst many of the aspects of my practice are traditional, the rice paste, the traditional paper, um, uh, other ways of working are things that evolve quite simply because my studio is the shape it is and with the materials that it has in it. So, so there's, a, there's a kind of assemblage of things from different cultures going on there. And it's also not traditional in the sense that um, whilst my work has some of the, the sort of aesthetic, the, the rather Japanese aesthetic that naturally derives from working in the, with, with stencils and a resi resist medium, um, I'm also um, working very much with my own language of, uh, of mark making and design, which comes from my own education and practice in a Western, in a European artistic cultural context. Um, so for this talk, I, I could have attempted to uh, map the contemporary practice of katazome. I could have looked at what's going on in, in Japan in the contemporary context and what's going on in, let's say, North America, Europe, the UK. Um, in practice, that's a very difficult kind of mapping exercise to do. Uh, for me to do that personally in Japan, I would certainly require a, a, a translator and, and lots of funding, which, which maybe will come to me one day. But um, also in the, in the context of uh, uh, North America, Europe, the UK, because so much of what's going on is in the context of amateur crafts practice. It's very difficult in practice to map. You can get a generalized kind of sense of there being a great deal of interest and a great deal of amateur practice and some small scale professional practice, but it's quite hard to, to quantify or to put pins on a map. Um, so rather than do that, I thought I would use my own practice as a um, as a sort of small case study of what happens, what can happen when when Katagami and the practice of katasome migrate into other cultures and, and uh, um, pass through what you might describe as a kind of transnational space of things or a transnational space of, of material culture. Um, it's, it's certainly the case that uh, both in Japan and in North America, Europe, the UK, there are both traditional forms of practice, highly traditional forms and um, uh, evolutions, uh, uh, diversions from traditional technique uh, in Japan, for instance, obviously you have a, a, a small number of craftspeople practicing in the traditional way, but it's it's no longer a, uh, something that can be easily financially sustainable because of the slowness of production and um, uh, fewer and fewer people train in this art. Nonetheless, there are um, there are artists, fine artists, for instance, like uh, Tobamika, who are using um, the, the methods of katazome to produce, you know, she, for instance, is using them to produce enormous you know, wall-sized drawings using stencils and, uh, and, and rice paste, and there are other um, less conventional uh, katazome artists as well. And similarly, outside of Japan, there are, people, um, there are people who go and study in Japan and who bring back these arts and practice them in a highly traditional way with traditional tools and all the traditional methods and often are paying homage to the the design languages of Japan by using traditional motifs. There are also people like myself who've, who have taken the technique and, and are exploring it, but, but uh, in terms of their own language and, and artistic heritage. Um, so, yeah, I'll, 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 I think it, perhaps it raises some interesting issues about, about what, what happens when these practices, these traditional crafts, um, migrate, um, the benefits that the, that can potentially have. Um, 
I, I came across an interesting interview with the kimono designer um, Jotaro Saito from Tokyo, who, who said um, the kimono cannot simply belong to Japan or it will disappear. So there's, but there's, there's the possibility perhaps that this transmigration and evolution can actually protect um, some of the traditional arts. What's true of the kimono, I think, is, is true of a lot of other traditional handcrafts and, and, and many of them are in a state of being threatened, not just in Japan, but in the UK and elsewhere. So I'm going to talk a bit about my background. I'm going to talk about the wonderful residency that I was involved in with, with Zoe and, and Mamiko. I'll talk a bit about my residency research and, um, and how my work has progressed from there. And, and then we can come back to this, this um, uh, issue of, of Katagami and Katazome in this transnational space, this migratory evolutionary kind of space and, and what might happen there. So my background, I started off as a fine artist. Um, I was a landscape painter and a still life painter. My work was always very heavily rooted in, in drawing and it still is. That's, that's something that my practice in textiles has in common with my early practice. Um, it gradually evolved to a, a more abstract work, uh, two-dimensional forms on two-dimensional surfaces, but um, uh, it remained very content laden. It was, it's my, 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 my painting and designing have never been about simply the visual. There's always content. There's, they're, 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 all my designs here are also heavily invested with, with content and, and meaning for me. So that's something that's, that's um, endured. Um, I think probably 15 or, or 10 years ago, whilst I was in the middle of a you know, long episode of, of uh, parenting, and my work was a little bit on the, on the back burner, and that gave me a chance to step back and, and look at what I was doing and ask myself whether, um, whether I was on the, on the right path. And I, I had a sort of epiphany. I was looking at a book of textiles one day, and textiles have always been a, a really key influence on my painting and my textile designing. I was looking at these textiles and thinking, I so much wish I had been a textile designer. And, um, and the, the thought flashed through my mind, nobody's stopping you. There are no rules that say you may not be a textile designer. If you want to do it, go do it. So uh, I underwent a rather sort of um, rapid shift in the textile direction, which meant a lot of reinventing the wheel, a lot of self-teaching, a lot of experimentation, uh, a lot of wasted fabric, a lot of uh, um, a, a, a slow and sometimes painful but generally enjoyable um, learning curve and the uh, the residency at Moda um, came along for me uh, just at the right time really I was I was drawn to it because of my love of Japanese textiles my, my love of slow textile processes and the manual and the particular and the um, the fastidious and the laborious and the obsessive. Um, uh, I was also drawn to it because it, it, the um, invitation to apply contained a very specific um, invitation to think about pedagogy, to think about how students at Middlesex uh, specifically might be um, encouraged to engage more actively with the collection of Katagami at Moda. Um, and I think it was, it's been suggested by Zoe that students not infrequently sort of come look at the collection and there are 400 stencils and it's all wonderful and exciting and they'll go through 400 very quickly dazed and amazed and take loads of photographs and then they'll walk out of the building and never think about them again and it's I, I can relate to that as a um in my my experience of um museums can also be ambivalent sometimes I can feel overwhelmed by too much stuff by too much virtuosity by um my incapacity to absorb things and also the sense that um, these objects, these artefacts often behind glass or in plastic wallets are somehow the sort of dead plotsam and jetsam of material culture and, and that they're no longer alive, they can't speak to us anymore, they won't divulge their secrets. But I also know that through my own practice of drawing and making, that those the drawing and making uh, specifically are very powerful ways to incorporate something. And I think the word inspiration, when we talk about artistic inspiration, is, is instructive, it's inspiration. It's the drawing in of something into ourselves and, the, and it's metabolization, it's conversion into other things. And I think that's, that's what has to happen for, some, for an artifact in the museum to be inspiring. We have to take it into ourselves in some meaningful way. We have to embody it, incorporate it, making and drawing ways of doing that. So that my proposal was to use making and drawing as a way of engage, engaging students with these artifacts. Um, so... I, and my, my residency started off with me doing lots of drawing in the museum. And drawing is a great way of, um, I think Glenn Adamson, Glenn Adamson said something like every act of 
drawing is, is an act of translation. You know, when you when you draw something, you put it into your own language of mark making. You you put it into your own vocabulary, and and when you do that, it becomes available for you as uh, as something that you can use then to to speak to communicate. Um, I think drawing also when you sit and draw things, you uh, tools effectively as these katagami are. You start to understand a lot more about why they function as they do, why they are as they are, what you know, what why, how they how they function, why they have to why they produce the sort of aesthetic they do, why that's a matter of material necessity rather than the, the whim of the, the designer. Um, so the drawing was very useful to me. And then I set it out to, to uh, start to learn the craft, um, largely self-taught using lots of resources online, books, and also the, the, the help of my research team, including Zoe and, and Namiko. Um, the rice paste bit of this process was the easy bit. I, I found a, a recipe online that worked immediately. I've used it ever since. It's the best resist uh, medium I've ever found. Uh, head, head and shoulders above anything that's used commercially in, in let's say, screen printing studios in, in the UK. It's, it's so good. You know, you can see from these kinds of textiles that, and uh, what we've been looking at, the precision of, of mark making and, and it's, it's beautiful, clean reproduction. It, it's, it's splendid. Cutting stencils was uh, also altogether more arduous thing to learn and of course I'm never going to achieve the virtuosity of the Japanese craftspeople but perhaps I think in the contemporary context that's beside the point you know we, we now have uh, Photoshop and digital printing that and uh, mechanized reproduction of all kinds that can produce that kind of virtuosic um, uh, precision and perfection and we in a sense we're no longer dazzled by that but what we are drawn to and excited by is the mark of the hand and and so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to allow the imperfections of my very imperfect hand cutting to persist in in, in what I produce. Um, what I did whilst I was learning stencil cutting with all its frustrations and all the broken stencils and clumsy cutting and poor designs that I produced uh, um, initially and still often produce, um, I, I, I decided to, to treat this learning curve as a, as a kind of ethnographer because I've done ethnographic research previously and I treated this as a kind of auto ethnography i.e I recorded in detail my personal experience but in with the broader aim of understanding a, a larger phenomenon um, that you know how, how one how one how one learns about and through a material technology um, so my notes are full of my frustrations and uh, um, but also I think when I when I did a thematic analysis of my notes I think what came through loud and clear was that what did most of the teaching was the materials themselves. I think, you know, materials are very lively um, uh, participants in this process. They protest and they obstruct and they say what they will do and what they won't do. And you can negotiate with them up to a point. You can say, well, if I did it like this, might you be prepared to do that? And the materials will sometimes say, OK, let's give that a go. And sometimes they just say no, but the materials teach you. The materials teach you, again, much like drawing, but more so, they, they teach you why, why an assemblage like indigo, stencil paper, rice paste functions the way it does, why it produces the things it does, how it, why it has to be the way that it is, the ways that it can evolve and the ways that it can't evolve. And that's very instructive. You know, it gave me a completely different sense of um, the objects as I first encountered them in, in the museum. Um, I then ran a three day workshop for a group of a fairly large group of students from Middlesex University. Um, it's a fantastic experience. They really enjoyed it. And I did a sort of evaluation, short bit of research out of that by um, asking them to write for me about whether or not their um, understanding of the Katagami as an artifact in the museum had changed as a result of their making practice and whether or not their own artistic practice had changed as a result of this encounter. And, if, you know, predictably, you know, yes, you know, they were deeply affected by it. They understood the object in a completely different way and they they took this inspiration off to use in their, in their own work. So this um, uh, it was a wonderful research project and it also, you know, I came out of it completely smitten with, with Katasome and, and I've printed all my textiles in this way since then and I'm still engaged in this long journey to explore, uh, you know, this long dialogue with the, with the materials which absolutely uh, fascinates me. Um, I'm you know, I love it because of the beauty of the results but, and, and, and because it's intensely pleasurable to do. Um, and it, 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 it works very well for me with drawing. I have got, a, a, I was going to show you just some, some sketchbook material. I do a lot of drawing um, on the spot uh, from 
if, if you like, these are the intuitive, intuitive drawings that are, that are done as mark making in response to landscape. You know, I'm going to sit on the beach or a, uh, I spent a lot of time on Hampstead Heath in the very early hours of the morning at the beginning of, of lockdown, just producing these kinds of drawings, which were, which were records of, of place, essentially. And these translate very, in, in quite a straightforward way, into, in fact, into my designs, things like um, uh, this, that drawing, for instance, became this, this scarf, I think. Uh, so, um, so, but it's not just the, it's not just the pleasure and the, and, and the, the um, en enjoyment that I have of this particular aesthetic that have kept me interested in this. It's also an interest in the process and in its extreme simplicity. These are, you know, the rice paste is made from essentially kitchen ingredients. You can make it in your mixer. You can, it won't poison you if you taste it. Uh, um, people can literally make it on their own bench. And I'm interested in the, in the democratization of creativity, if you like, and how everyone potentially can become a maker. Um, I'm interested in that for the, because I think that the, the low tech and the slow in making uh, um, and, and teaching people that they can make their own stuff is relevant for a sustainable culture of consumption. Um, and I, I, I know we need to act very urgently uh, to, to counteract the, the damaging effects of our fast textiles culture. And I, I, and I know this is a very small contribution to the movement against that, but I do think that we can, we can encourage people to appreciate the value of fewer, better things to use Glenn Adamson's phrase by teaching them to make their own stuff. So I do a lot of uh, workshopping and I, this is part of the, the huge value of, of Katazome for me is it's, it's, it's such a beautiful exemplar of the wonderful richness and complexity that can be achieved with very simple means by people on their own kitchen tables. Um, I'm also interested in the relevance of this kind of slow making that's highly pleasurable and, and immersive for mental health. And I've worked a lot in, in, in arts for health and uh, including um, using Katasome in, in that field. Um, so I'll, I'll return briefly to, the, to where I started off with, which is this issue of um, uh, Katagami and, and Katasome that had been circulating in, in, in uh, transnational space for for over a hundred years um i think sometimes there can be a fear that heritage crafts are damaged by this kind of migration and uh, and evolution um but i think um there are one could argue the opposite point of view in fact i mean i think it's very important that one has clarity about one's own work and to what extent it's authentic i would make no claims to be an authentic uh, practitioner of katazome for instance although i use the, the sort of key materials of that uh, um, medium, but um, uh, it, it's it's good to understand and and, and value and highly respect the the the, the more traditional forms, um, and to, and to share one's knowledge about those as well as one's own own practice. Um, but I'm also I'm wary of the idea of a kind of pure practice in any of the heritage crafts. I, I think ever since people have wandered around and shared and traveled with their materials and shared their materials and their ideas, the crafts and you know, all kinds of making technologies have been in, um, in evolution. And um, uh, the, the Japanese stencil printing tradition came out of a, a Chinese one using a, a different resist medium, for instance, and, and uh, the Japanese makers took on the, the local materials and, and um, allowed it to evolve. And I think one reason why crafts traditions evolve is because materials are active. They're, they're far from kind of inert things that do our bidding. They're, they're very lively things that have a life of their own and, and insist on doing new things when they're brought into conjunction with new, new cultural contexts. And I find that exciting. I don't think it's something that we can stand in the way of, although we can continue to, to value and educate about um, uh, tradition. But there's lots of research evidence to suggest that uh, um, traditional crafts are, are surviving partly by repositioning themselves as, as practices that are more to do with, well not more to do with, but that have as much to do with, with education and well-being and sustainability and uh, um, uh, as they do towards making more stuff. We, you know, we've, the world has enough stuff in a sense that's perhaps what, not necessarily what we need um, uh, creative making for, you know, it, it has other uh, we can value other aspects of it, and that's how it may well survive. And so when we're thinking about contemporary katagami and katasome, we're not 
we're not necessarily just thinking about the value of preserving an endangered, like a sort of endangered craft species. We're also thinking about um, the, the perpetuation and evolution of, of methods and design languages and, uh, and what happens in new cultural and social contexts. And I, I think we can celebrate that. So um, I'm very lucky to be working in this media. And thank you, uh, Zoe, for, 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 for the extraordinary opportunity to participate in, in the yeah, murder project. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. I must admit that every time I look at your textiles, I'm blown away by the detail and the, 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 how fine they are. And uh, yes, they're, they're absolutely stunning. Um, there been a well, there was a question in in the chat. Somebody was asking um, if there are workshops and classes that people can take um, in Katazome. Um, I should mentioned that we're delighted, we're really pleased that in, as, as a kind of parallel event to this, to tonight's lecture, Sarah has kindly agreed to give a one day workshop on uh, Katazome um, on Saturday the 3rd of October. Um, I haven't spoken to Kyoko today about this, but as of yesterday, I think there was one place still going. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if it's still there or not, uh, Kyoko, but uh, mm -hmm. um, if you are interested. I know Sarah also does other workshops. You were doing a residency in the Isle of Wight and doing some other workshops. Do you know what, what I've else? Got a, I've got a forthcoming one with Salvage Magazine, which is sometime after Christmas. I don't have a date for it, but I'm also really happy to, to, to run more for anybody who's interested. And what I have discovered is that they translate very easily to online, which has surprised me greatly but it, that, that works really well. Uh, the last one I, I did, I had a, an audience that were variously in, in, in the US and, uh, and the UK and Europe and uh, yeah, it works really well. And so um, I have a website which is sarahdemery.com and you can contact me via there if you're interested in workshops or yeah, that's probably the easiest way. That's brilliant, thank you Sarah. And I think for the um, workshop with uh, um, uh, Japan Society, um, on the third, you're going to be sending out materials to participants. So it's for this one, we're looking for people who are based in the UK where you can actually post stuff to so that you don't have to run around and, and pick things up. Um, and before we get onto the, the rules and regs on, on uh, questions, somebody also was asking Zoe whether it's possible to visit the collection at all? Um, yes. I mean, COVID allowing. <laughs> Yeah, so um, appointments uh, at Moda are by, uh, visits are always by appointment. We haven't been running appointments for the last few months because of COVID, but we're hoping to start them again by hopefully the end of September or early October. So check the website and we'll be updating via the website and social media to let people know when, when appointments are available again. But yes, at that point, people can certainly come and see the Kasagami collection and everything else we've got. Uh, but also have a look at the website as well to, to sort of see the, the range of things we have in the collection. I know there's a lot, there's so much information on that website. You could, you could lose yourself down that well enough for quite a long time, I think. Uh, I actually said speaking from experience. Um, <laughs> Zoe, then can I ask a question about the, um, the collection in, uh, and, and um, Arthur Silver and his, his studio and their work? Can we, are there any extant examples of materials and, and wallpapers and so on that have been made through by um by the studio using these inspiration you know the, the uh, yes so i didn't really uh, have time to show you but the the the, um, the rotman silver stencil venture that i was talking about um produced a number of kind of quite large format wall coverings which we have uh, in the collection um, and we're not quite sure if it ever went into full production because I think it was quite a labour intensive thing and they hadn't really got their heads around how to do it properly and Arthur Silver died um, you know quite quite young just before the um, the project really got off the ground but but yes we do have those stenciled wall coverings which are quite spectacular in their way yeah and as I say, lots of other examples of uh, designs for wallpapers and textiles where katagami have been included in, in, the, in the design. Presumably some of them would have been ended up in sort of historic houses and stately homes or arts and crafts homes knocking around that people can visit and might, and might see. Um, 
Yeah, so the, art, the, um, the Silver Studio tended to sell to manufacturers who were, broadly speaking, at the lower end of the market. So they sold to people like Liberty, but also to other manufacturers who were selling to just, you know, your average um, middle class and lower middle class consumers. So not all of their designs of, or very many of their designs don't um, exist now in, in homes around the country because they were the sort of things that would be used and then just people would paper over them the next time or you know, textiles get worn out. So that's why the collection is quite um, interesting as a, 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 as a record of the sort of middle class and lower middle class taste in Britain between the end of the 19th century and the middle of the 20th century. Sarah, do you want to talk about the kind of um, papers that you use at the moment for your practice and um, where it comes from? Mm. I use some, um, I'm using traditional Japanese paper for the most part. Um, I'm, uh, I have at, I have sometimes managed to get it from Japan, but at the moment the easiest place for me to order it is from a supplier in, in Canada, which um, eradicates language problems involved in getting it from Japan. Um, when I go to Japan, I, I hope to uh, um, sort out that, that problem and find someone who can send me direct. Um, it's beautiful paper. It's absolutely wonderful to use it because it's because of the the, the fermented persimmon juice and the that, that's used to to um, uh, stick the layers of, of, of paper together and because of the smoking that it's subjected to it's fragrant you know it smells of fruit and smoke and it's, you know, it's, it's just brilliant and as you cut it it uh, um, it, it, this fragrance emerges and um, I can say something from uh, my own uh, practice about the durability of the stencils I've got small stencils that I've made that have sometimes lasted absolutely undamaged for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of prints. Uh, this kind of, this, the stencil that, uh, that I use for this, for instance, has just gone on and on and on. And I, there are other stencils, that, the, the one that I used in, in, in making this dress, which was a ridiculous elongated shape, um, uh, broke repeatedly and had to be recut. Um, so I think it depends quite a lot certainly at my level of practice, which is not a, a very elevated one, it depends quite a lot on the, on the design itself. And again, this is something that the, the, the material's teaching me. If you, if you cut these kinds of forms, they'll endure and they won't fall to bits. If you try cutting these kinds of forms or this shape of stencil, it will all fall to bits. So, um, and there's also something about the accuracy of cutting. I'm quite sure that the Japanese masters produced stencils that were much more durable than mine because they didn't, they didn't for instance, cross lines at corners, thus making them, you know, very terrible at these points, whereas that's the kind of thing that as a, as a, a beginner level practitioner, I, I might do. Um, okay. I've occasionally ex experimented with, I, when I'm working on a larger scale, I've sometimes experimented with other kinds of paper. Sometimes I've, I've accepted that my, my stencil won't endure very long and use materials that aren't really suitable for stenciling at all. I've, I've tried okay, in desperation, okay, or just for the sake of an experiment, I've tried um, mylar plastic and so on, but they're horrible to use. And I'm trying to get plastic out of my life at least a bit. So um, the, the paper is my favorite material. <laughs> How do you clean the stencil after you've um, you know, taken, a, taken a print? They're very easy to clean because the um, the rice paste is extremely soluble in water. It's it's perfect because it's it's um, it it dries hard enough to resist water for a considerable period of time. You can roll a dye onto it. You can dip in indigo without the without uh, the um, resist losing its strength. Um, but when you take a, a stencil covered in wet rice rice paste to a to a tap with a soft brush, it's the easiest thing in the world to get the paste off. So um, yeah. Easy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we've had another question um, uh, from uh, Lilia, I think, um, asking whether um, katagami in the Edo and the Meiji periods, whether uh, stencils would be, have been made for export particularly, um, so the ones that maybe found their way to the silver studio, would they have been made for export or just picked up by chance um, by people in Japan? So um, the majority of those in the Silver Studio collection were made for the Japanese, you know, the traditional style, and they would have just been acquired by somebody who visited Japan and, and bought them. And we do have a small proportion 
which we think were made for the export market. And they, they look a little bit different in the sense that they, they, don't have, um, they don't have quite the same repeating pattern. If you notice when, when Mamiko was showing her slides, that, te that um, kimono, the way that um, kimonos are made from one, just one length of fabric, the pattern often has to go both up, up and down. It's a multi-directional pattern. And so katagami uh, has to repeat in, in both directions. Uh, whereas the, the, the katagami in the collection, which we think were produced for the, text, for the export market, are just individual designs with a kind of border. So we think they were intended for maybe towels or cushion covers or something which would have which would have been more suitable for western tastes um another question if one stencil is used repeatedly along a length of fabric how do you prevent the paste from smudging at the edge of the reprint as, as you will have seen the traditional katagami are cut with large borders which means when you do place the, 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 the top of the design down next to the bottom of the the, the last imprint, the, the, the paper at the top is like, likely to come in touch into contact with the paste, making a, a terrible mess. And I have seen uh, pictures of people using pins to prop up that top piece of paper so that it doesn't uh, fall down into the paste. I've tried that myself. I've tried being very careful. I've tried all kinds of things. I haven't, that's not a technique I've mastered. It's certainly when I go to Japan, when I get there, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to find out about that. And if, in, in the end, in my own work, I, mean, I guess this is one instance of the way that I've allowed the materials to teach me in a, in a very unorthodox manner, you know, where the, where the materials have suggested to me, well, why not do it this way? I've sometimes gone with, with, with a solution that the materials in some sense suggested or invented. Um, the, the, the way that I'm printing is to cut stencils uh, up very close to the edge of the stencil and using designs which aren't spoiled by the, the presence of horizontal and, and vertical lines. And you can probably see in all of, in all of these that you know, vertical lines are even easily hidden in, in this kind of pattern, for instance. This, this skirt was cut with an eccentrically shaped um, trapezoid stencil that was very, very long and broke very easily, I might say, but, um, but it solved the problem of because it was cut very close to the edge and because that vertical edge was hidden in the design, you, you don't see it in the, in the repeat. Um, other stencils here, you can see I'm, I'm, I, I printed this, um, my repeat is a mirrored repeat rather than a top to bottom one. And obviously you have different uh, problems designing repeat that has to go across as well as up and down. If you're printing a, a bolt of, of uh, kimono fabric, you've only got to deal with the up and down problem. My stencils are also, uh, you know, a whole variety of very odd shapes, including my, my bizarre trapezoid skirt stencils. But, you know, so the, the stencil used for, for that is, is about this size, but um, cut in such a way and, and designed in such a way that the, the, the vertical and horizontal lines that you see there, which are part of the border of the stencil, are not, you know, they're part of the design rather than a kind of impediment to it. So this is part of the way in which I, I've allowed the materials to push me in, in my own context and in that, that context has to take in, uh, into account the fact that I, I'm a, a Katazome novice and haven't been taught the traditional way to do these things. Sarah, may I ask you a question? Uh, on the paper you're using, um, is it of the same type of um, strength and feel that the traditional Katazome uh, uh, are? Um, was it, sorry, was that addressed to me? Yes, I'm yes. sorry. Yes, um, yes, yes. yes you know, I'm... People may not realise when you talk about paper that we're not talking about something that is floppy. They're fairly stiff, yeah. but the art comes into making a product which is stiff, it keeps its shape and stays flat, yeah. uh, but also is not too tough to cut easily. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's where the art in making the, uh, yes. the original yeah. material comes in. Yeah. Uh, mm, some people may get the impression that it's actually quite a floppy piece of paper. And yeah, in fact, it's, more like, it's what one thinks of as stencil paper, isn't it? It's a yeah, bit, uh, although, it's, although it's finer and easier to cut than anything, anything that I've 
come across to, you know, like, it's, not, it's, it's much, much finer and crisper and easier to cut with a sharp blade than, let's say, manila paper, which mm. is a kind of European equivalent. And, and it does certainly, this, the paper that I've acquired from Japan varies in thickness a little bit. I've had different thicknesses, but in, in general, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's brittle, but it has this unique, you know, as you're saying, a really completely unique set of qualities mm. that make it this kind of perfect stencil paper, really. Yeah. We've had a lot of people um, sort of saying thank you to you all for your presentations, but perhaps a, a, a great qu a question maybe to end on um, from Suzanne, Suzanne Perrin, which may plant a seed for you, Zoe, or give you some ammunition, but are there any plans for an exhibition on the Moda collection in the future? Um, unfortunately, we don't have plans at the moment. We did have a small exhibition at the end of our uh, Arts Council funded projects in 2018. Um, we don't have plans at the moment, but, you know, never say never. Watch this space. <laughs> Let's hope. We'll keep our fingers crossed uh, and, and look forward maybe one day to visiting you and, and seeing, you know, all of these beautiful uh, designs. I mean, they are extraordinary. And you've got so much, um, so many of them are photographed on your website, aren't they? So yeah, if you have a look online, there are lots, lots to see there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, do have a look. Okay, thank you. Well, I think it is time for us to bring this evening to uh, the session to a close. Um, thank you all in the audience very much for attending and joining us tonight, but in particular, huge thanks to Zoe, Sarah and Mamiko for such rich and uh, insightful and um, for sharing their knowledge and their experiences in a very frank and open way. So I really appreciate um, you know, your participation and for giving us your time this evening. And good luck with your ongoing research and work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.